Namaskar and welcome to this class where we will discuss about internet and its traits. I am Pratishtha Adhikari, lecturer of Diet Nalbari. So in today's uh, world, internet has become an inseparable part of our daily life because from the morning to night time, we use internet in uh, every sphere of our life. So let us see what the internet is basically. Internet, which is also known as the World Wide Web, is a global system of interconnected computer networks that uses a protocol which is known as the Internet Protocol Suite. It links billions of devices all around the world. So in short, we can say that Internet is an interconnected network of networks. And in today's era, the impact of internet has become so enormous that it has been compared with the eight continent of the world. So we all know that at present there are seven continents in this world and you imagine that internet has been named as the eight continent of this world. So now let us move to the salient features of the internet. Let us see how internet works. Internet connects computer across the world via more than 750,000 miles which is almost equal to 12 lakhs kilometers of cables. So such a large, uh, so you can imagine such a large uh, amount of cable is required to get the internet that we use in our everyday life. And these cables run under the land or the sea. That is, they are underwater or under marine, under sea level. This internet is a giant computer network linking billions of machines together by underground and underwater fiber optics cable, as I have already mentioned earlier. Each cable contains strands of glass that transmits data as pulses of light. Now moving on to the history of internet, let us see how it came into existence. So to begin with, internet was first originated in the United States when the US government first used it during the Cold War and they used it for their military search. They founded the Advanced Research Projects Agency which was in short known as the ARPA and it was used to link two computers initially to share some very confidential data of the US military ring. So does the computer net that is ARPA net was formed and gradually it expanded uh, to uh, the number of and gradually the number of computers expanded and till the end of 1980s it became more than 30,000 machines that ARPA net could uh, communicate together. Now let us see how does internet works. As I have already mentioned that internet sends data around the world across some land and sea, underwater or under soil cables and these are displayed in the submarine cable map. So there is one map where we can see the distribution of cables which are underwater or under soil. Uh, that are distributed across the continents and we get the internet from those cables. So let us have a look at this. So let us have a look at this submarine cable map. So this is a view of the submarine cable map where you can see the distribution of cables these are the cables these colored wires that you can see over here are the cables which are underwater or under uh, soil through which we can get internet and uh, now we can uh, figure out our country India so here you can see this is India and uh, here it is Nepal or Pakistan 
uh, and these are the cables you can see that this is the cable network uh, one nomenclature has been given over here this is the Bay of Bengal gateway this is uh, again uh, see me with six this is also as another uh, nomenclature this is India Asia Express so these are some of the nomenclatures that have been given to the different uh, cable and these cables are distributed throughout the continents across the world uh, with the help of which we get internet in our systems. The data passes between networks until it reaches the one closest to its destination and then it passes through the local routers until it arrives at the computer with the machine IP address. Uh, now let us see what is IP. The internet relies upon the two connecting computers speaking the same digital language. We know that computers speak a different language. This is different from the human language. Okay. They uh, use uh, advanced uh, language. Uh, the language we say to the computers is transformed to the machine language and uh, that's how they communicate with each other and to achieve this there is a set of rules which are known as the transmission control protocol which is in short known as the uh, TCP and internet protocol in short known as the IP. Uh, and there are two main types of computer networks. One is the local area network which we call in short as LAN and one is the wide area network which we uh, call as WEN in short. Now let us see what a LAN is. A LAN is two or more connected laptops or computers or even phones sharing information with each other in a small geographic location. For example, a network of computers at your home or work. Like we uh, use a uh, network connection for our home. Most of us use a network connection for our home nowadays. So if I can connect my computer, uh, my uh, laptop, my phone and um, you know few more uh, devices all together through this network. So that network will be known as the local area network. Similarly for an educational institution if all the computer sets are interconnected through a single network so that network will be known as the local area network. But what is when? When is a uh, uh, interconnected network of two or more LANs? What is LAN? Uh, what is WAN? WAN is the interconnected network of two or more LANs, that is local area networks. So these networks are further apart than the systems in LAN. So you can imagine that uh, WAN is far more wider in its uh, spread than a LAN. So let us now move on to see what are the uses of internet in the education field. We have already discussed that internet has become an integral part of our daily life nowadays and we can see the uses of internet everywhere, be it the uh, hospital sector, be it the banking sector, be it the travel sector and nowadays even in the education sector, computer or uh, internet has uh, taken a very important role. So let us see what are the main features or functions that the internet do in the education sector. So we can see over here that internet makes the education cost effective. Yes, internet makes the education cost effective because earlier in the traditional mode of classroom what happened that the students had to come physically to our educational institution, take proper admission and then he or she would get uh, the chance to access the course materials for that particular course and at the end they would have uh, received a completion certificate. Okay. So now what happens that with the advent of uh, internet, uh, the students can access any course from any institution, be it a general local institution or uh, be it a renowned institution, they can access any course online without going physically to that institution and that definitely makes the education cost effective for them because it saves their uh, travel cost and time as well. Then it provides peer interaction. Yes, internet 
helps us to uh, get peer interaction because earlier when there was no internet to get an interaction with the peer or your thing to get access or um, assessed by anyone somebody had to physically send uh, their content or material uh, through post or like that but nowadays with the advent of internet in our hand we can instantly send our materials or our um, content to anybody for a review or interaction and that makes uh, the education be more collaborative and uh, helps in uh, building the 21st century skills and and helps in developing the 21st century skills as well then coming to the learning tools yes internet has provided us with a lot of learning tools nowadays and with the help of those learning tools one student can get access to a number of resources educational resources free of cost uh, free of cost for their own benefit internet also provides quality education i have already mentioned that quality education is possible nowadays with the help of internet and uh, it is a source for updated information definitely because if there is an advertisement or there uh, there is a news that is flashing that has happened just now or that has been uploaded just now with the help of internet we can get access to that information right at this moment but earlier that was not possible then internet also helps in bridge communication gaps definitely uh, with the help of uh, internet we can communicate instantly with our peer or with our mentors and thus the communication gap is minimized to a large extent it is time flexible that if i take uh, admission if i take admission to any course uh, online I do not have to go physically uh, to get the course materials, rather I can access the course materials at the convent of my timing. So if I am uh, walking somewhere uh, in daytime, I can have an access to my course materials at night. Or if I am walking at night, I can have access to my materials uh, in the early morning. So it is. Uh, as per my convenience or as per the convenience of the students that they can get access to the course materials and thus uh, internet has given a time flexibility it helps in self development because nowadays there are so many platforms for self development some mooc platforms are there massive open online course platforms are also there which help uh, the students for self development they provide some certification course or diploma courses and uh, such kind of uh, courses uh, help the students or motivate the students for self development then the motivational factor uh, as I have already mentioned that uh, the students in their student life pass through many phases and there comes certain phases when a student feels very low uh, at point of times but internet gives us an access to some motivational factors with the help of which the students uh, having uh, being at his or her own home or own place he can access to those motivational boost up uh, be it comments or videos uh, which can definitely boost up the moral ability of that student and it also helps in concept clarity through virtual field trips so if it is not possible for a very remote educational institution to uh, uh, bring its students to you know some of the uh, to get an exposure of so if it is not possible for a very remote area school to give access to its students for a uh, you know certain uh, phenomenon the virtual field trips can help the students to get the real like feeling or exposure uh, of that particular phenomenon online so these are some of the benefits or uses of internet in the education sector now moving on the threats of using computer the way computer has become our household friend 
at the same time computer has also been proven as a threat to our daily life because there are many uh, instances where using of computer using of internet has proven to be a life threatening even has proven to be a life threatening uh, measure for somebody so let us see what are the threats of using internet the first one is phishing what is phishing phishing is a form of social engineering where attackers deceive people into revealing sensitive information or installing malware such as ransomware we most of us have been getting certain emails uh, that you have won uh, a lottery in the US lottery system or your mobile number has won uh, a lottery amounting to rupees uh, 20 million and uh, they ask you to give uh, your details uh, including your bank accounts and we in the hope of getting that 20 million just sitting at our home we uh, do not hesitate to reveal our information but these links or these emails have proved to be a malicious uh, trick of the uh, cyber criminals which uh, trick you to reveal your intimate information your personal information uh, releasing to your account details so uh, phishing can be of two types basically one is phishing which is uh, voice calls uh, phishing involving voice calls using either conventional phone systems or voice over internet protocol systems so if you get a call uh, uh, stating that you have won uh, this much of prize money or your car has won uh, your car um, uh, or your car has won uh, a lottery or your home your mobile number has won a lottery you have uh, won a lottery amounting to this much of amount so uh, we should never fall for such uh, emails or phone calls because they generally trick us to reveal our personal information uh, if we fall into such tricks we may uh, end up losing our hard-earned money one uh, form is the wishing and another form of phishing is the smishing what is smishing? Smishing involves sending bogus text messages that appear to come from a legitimate source such as a bank or a social media site. And most messages have a sense of urgency and request the recipient click on a link or reply with personal information. So um, I can recall some of the instances, some of the real life instances that uh, uh, most of the times you get a friend request this is the case of the social media site okay so most of the time um, sometimes we get a friend request from one of our uh, uh, you know known person which who is already in our friend list but we get a friend request from a different account of that particular person and that person starts uh, talking to you, communicating with you through uh, text messages or uh, the, uh, if I say, the messenger systems of those social site, uh, social media sites. So uh, they uh, start a communication process with you, and since you know that person, you think that this is the real person who is talking to you, and you respond to that person. Uh, with a very good heart and after some time that person urges that he has fallen into an urgency and he needs money for that urgency and being a well-wisher he uh, urges you to deposit a particular amount of money to his account and you thinking that this is the real person your friend or your known person you uh, tend to deposit your money uh, that um, the asked amount of money to that person's account number but what happens as soon as you transfer your money to that person's account number you may end up as I have already said you may end up losing all of your hard earned money because that those are a type of scams that are happening nowadays so smishing is a kind of uh, uh, you know bogus text messages they may send the messages through text 
or through uh, messenger, social uh, media site messengers asking for money or um, revealing your account details. Next, there is another uh, type of internet threat that is farming. Now what is farming? Farming is very similar to fishing but what happens that in fishing we uh, that, that the hacker or the cyber criminal tries to trick the person, the individual to reveal his or her own personal information. But in farming what happens, the computer itself is deceived. How? Let's have a look. Fishing, oh, sorry, farming is an online scam which is similar to phishing where a website's traffic is manipulated and confidential information is stolen. It is a more advanced cyber attack intended to redirect a website's traffic into another by creating a fake site. It is done through installing a malicious program on the computer. In essence, it is the criminal act of producing a fake website and then redirecting the users to it. So what happens? Uh, let me sh again share one instance that if you are uh, searching for a particular organization's website, uh, you may uh, go to the World Wide Web and you type in the uh, address bar uh, the link of the website or the name of the uh, name of the company. But those cyber criminals which uh, are involved in farming, they manipulate the traffic of that original website and they redirect the traffic to a fake website that is created by those cyber criminals and you end up landing at their fake website. And once you land up at the fake website and you uh, reveal some of your personal information, be it a financial information, credit information or any of the personal informations they at once trick you and they get all the information they steal all the information from you and you may end up as a loser so uh, this is a very uh, severe type of or advanced type of cyber attack i would say because they deceive in this case the computer because when we search in the world wide web the name of any uh, anything in fact, the uh, World Wide Web shows up uh, with uh, thousands of search results. But we have to know which search results are accurate or authenticated that we can rely on. Uh, those persons who are not aware, they may end up landing at a fake website uh, as I have uh, just mentioned and uh, they may be at danger. Moving on to the next type of threat that is spam injections via comment. Now what is this? Let us have a look. One thing that we often overlook is the use of internet by educational institutes. Now can, nowadays we can see that most of the educational institutes have their own blog or their educational websites. But if the educational website or the blog is not maintained or created properly, it may create a problem for the institution as a whole. So uh, all things should also be handled with care and control. But it is seen that in most of the cases, these blogs or websites remain neglected with weak security measures. And this leave a pass to uh, the, uh, and this makes them not only look unprofessional, but also makes or poses a serious threat to them. Because if the website or uh, that blog for an educational institution is not uh, having proper security measures, anybody, any hacker can uh, have access to that website and uh, does having uh, access to that website or blog, they can have information about all the students and anything can happen afterwards. So it is very important to have proper security measures if an educational institution is uh, having its own own blog or uh, website. Moving on to the next kind of threat is malware. What is malware? Malware is one of the most common and dangerous cyber attacks. Yes, unlike phishing it is much harder to spot right on because it can take multiple forms and be spread to various methods. Often people notice it as some of a virus 
kind of attacks in their uh, devices, but they have adaptive nature and change their codes in response to their environment. However, in case of a common network such as a school, it may attack the whole system as such. So, with the help of malware, it is not just a simple virus attack, it can uh, have access to the uh, it can have access to all the information of the people who are associated with that particular system. The next form of threat is form jacking. Now what is it? Form jacking is a term used to describe the use of malicious JavaScript code to steal credit card details and other information from payment forms on the checkout web pages of e-commerce sites. It is slightly different form of cyber security threat which involves criminal activity when someone takes over a portion of uh, or full control of a website by illegal means. So nowadays we see that we are often uh, uh, in a tend to buy things online because internet has uh, the or advancement of technology has given us that uh, ease of life that we do not have to go outside to have something um, that belongs to us or we can have it at our home. We just have to uh, choose online, give the order online and the product will be delivered at our doorsteps. But having done that, we always try to pay online. But having done that, we most of the cases try to make the payment online and uh, in such cases, this form checking uh, tries to steal the credit card details or other information from the checkout web pages. Like if you might have noticed that when you are about to check out for a particular order, you are asked to give your card details or if you are uh, paying through net banking, you have to put your details. And uh, most in most of the cases, the site asks you to store the card details for future uses so that you do not have to type the details of the cards again and again. And we, to save our time, we tend to... Uh, uh, keep or save the details of the card at the web pages but sometimes these actions may be very dangerous because if a hacker or cyber attacker is looking at us and uh, through uh, this form checking they can steal our credit card details and we may end up uh, losing our money. Now coming to the next form is hacking. Yes, uh, hacking is a term that we often uh, come across and we uh, think uh, that this is hacking, uh, we steal information, the hackers steal information. Now, let us see what hacking actually is. Hacking is the act of identifying and then exploiting weakness in a computer system or network usually to gain unauthorized access to personal or organizational data. So, it is something that uh, through unauthorized ma means we can get access to the data which pertains to a particular system or network. But uh, hacking is not always a bad thing as we generally think of. Hacking is malicious but the term has mostly negative connotations due to its association with cybercrime because most of the cybercrimes use this hacking. Uh, techniques to uh, steal information. So hackings or hackers are also of different types. So let us have a look what are the different types of hackers. The term hacking was first appeared as a term in 1970s but it became popular in 1980s and there are different types of hackers as I have already mentioned. Let us have a look what are the types of hackers are. The first one are the white hat hackers. These are the hackers who work to keep data safe from other hackers. These are the hackers who work to keep data safe from other hackers by finding system vulnerabilities that can be mitigated. White hats are usually employed by the target system's owner and are typically paid for their work. 
their work is not illegal because it is done with the system owner's consent. Sometimes what happens if you are running an organization and you think of maintaining security within your system and you think that the information, the secret information about your organization should not go out, then you may appoint a hacker who will work for you to protect the uh, system vulnerabilities uh, by mitigating the system vulnerabilities and protect it from other uh, hackers. So these type of hackers are called as white hat hackers and they work for good and they are paid for uh, their work by the uh, owners of that organization who hire them. The next uh, type of hackers are called as the black hat hackers and these hackers uh, are with malicious intentions. They often steal, exploit and sell data and are usually motivated by personal gain. They work, their work is usually illegal. A cracker or black hat hackers is like a black hat hacker but uh, is specifically someone who is very skilled and tries via hacking to make profits or to benefit not just to cause damage. Now let us have a look at the next type of hacker. These are called as a black hat hackers. Now what are black hat hackers? They are hackers with malicious intentions. They often steal or exploit and sell data and are usually motivated by personal gain. Their work is usually illegal. So what do the black hat hackers do that they uh, steal or exploit data from any organization or any system and they use it for their own personal gain. So basically the black hat hackers uh, work are illegal and uh, we can term uh, them as a bad hackers. So next are the grey hat hackers. The grey hat hackers are a category that fall between the white hat hackers and the black hat hackers. Now they are not certified hackers as the white hat hackers. These type of hackers work with either good or bad intentions. The hacking might be for their own gain and the intention behind hacking this is decided by the type of hacker. So basically the grey hat hackers uh, do both good or bad things. Sometimes they do the uh, good type of things that they uh, uh, safeguard the system or the organization's data or at the same time sometimes they might do some bad things for their personal gain. So these are the grey hat hackers. Next comes the green hat hackers. The green hat hackers are the types of hackers who learn the ropes of hacking. The intent is to strive and learn to become a full-fledged hackers. They are looking for opportunities to learn from experienced hackers. That means these green hat hackers are newly learned hackers. They have not yet gone through the full course of hacking. They are just learning from experienced hackers and they uh, strive to learn and become as a uh, full-fledged hackers. So this uh, stage of hackers is called as the green hat hackers. Moving on to the next type are the blue hat hackers. The blue hat hackers use hacking as a weapon to gain popularity among their fellow beings. They use hacking to settle scores with their adversaries. In a sense, they are dangerous due to the intent behind the hacking rather than their knowledge. So these blue hat hackers are also not professional hackers or they are not fully uh, uh, learned hackers you can say but they use hacking as a weapon to get familiarized or popularized among their fellow beings. So they want to become popular that look I also know hacking I can do this or that. So these type of hackers are called as blue hat hackers. Then the next type is the red hat hackers. The red hat hackers are synonymous with eagle eyed hackers. They are the types of hackers who are similar to white hackers. The red hat hackers intend to stop the attacks of the black hat hackers. 
but only difference between the red hat hackers and the white hat hackers is the process of the hacking although their intention remains the same <coughs> The only difference between red hat hackers and white hat hackers is the process of hacking although the intention remains the same. The red hat hackers are quite ruthless when dealing with the black hat hackers or counteracting malware. So basically the red hat hackers also work for the good for the organization or the for safety of the data for a particular organization just like the white hat hackers but what do the red hat hackers do they are very ruthless in dealing with those black hat hackers or uh, fighting with the malware so um, it is the only process of hacking that is different between red hat hackers and the white hat hackers then comes the next category the script kiddies the script kiddies are amateurs types of hackers in the field of hacking. They try to hack the system, networks or websites with scripts from other fellow hackers. The intention behind this type of hacking is just to get attention of their peers. Script kiddies are generally juveniles who do not have completed the knowledge of the hacking process. So now we can see that these are the very, uh, you know, uh, those adolescent uh, uh, kids uh, who have just started learning the hacking process. So they uh, want to uh, steal some information uh, by... Now moving on to the next type, uh, the script kiddies. Now what are these? Script kiddies are the amateurs type of hackers in the field of hacking. They try to hack the system, the networks or the websites with scripts from other fellow hackers. The intention behind this type of hacking is just to get attention from their peers. Script kiddies are generally juveniles who do not have completed knowledge of the hacking process. So as you have seen that script kiddies are the adolescent period kids who have just learned the hacking process or who have not yet completed the uh, hacking uh, as a course but they want to do the hacking with the scripts from their fellow uh, hackers and by doing that they want to get popularized among their peers or get attention with their fellow beings. So this is the main intention of script kiddies. Uh, and besides the above mentioned types, there are three more types of hackers who work in different capacities. Now have a look at uh, these three types of uh, hackers. One is the state or nation sponsored hackers. So the government appoints some hackers to gain information about other countries. These type of hackers are known as state or nation sponsored hackers. They use their knowledge to gain confidential information from other countries to be well prepared for any upcoming danger to their country. So generally all the states or countries uh, appoint such kind of hackers uh, to gain uh, information about other countries or other states uh, so that if any uh, threat is coming uh, uh, in way their state or particular uh, nation they can be well prepared to fight with it. Then the next type is the uh, hacktivist. This type of hackers intend to hack government websites. They pose themselves as activists, so known as hacktivists. Hacktivists can be an individual or a bunch of nameless hackers who intent, uh, whose intent is to gain access to government websites and networks. The data gained from government files access are used for personal, political or social gains. So it is a very common type in fact nowadays because um, in um, uh, every now and then you can hear that a uh, government official website uh, has been hacked by some of the hackers. So these are nothing but the hacktivists. They uh, pretend to be activists but they are actually hackers who steal information from that particular department, government departments and they steal that information for their personal gain or social gain or some of the political gains. And the last type of uh, a hacker, special category hackers are the malicious insider or whistleblower. 
This type of hackers include individuals working in an organization who can expose confidential information about that organization. The intent behind the exposure might be a personal grudge against the organization or the individual might have come across illegal activities within the organization. So uh, if an employee is having a personal grudge against uh, the organization he is already employed in, uh, so he can uh, be involved as a malicious insider or whistleblower. He is already an insider for that organization, but, but he is stealing information, precious or uh, secret information from that organization and uh, is uh, sending it to somebody uh, who might be an uh, opponent of that particular organization. Or sometimes it may happen that the uh, that employee, that particular employee, has been given a uh, uh, bribe of uh, some money to reveal the information about his own organization and he is uh, involved in this kind of activities so these are the whistleblowers now with all these things uh, one go uh, now what are the ways to protect ourselves from the internet threats we have uh, come across the various uh, types of uh, threats that uh, we can have by using internets. Now let us have a quick look at the measures which we can use to uh, minimize such internet attacks. So uh, it is advisable to install an antivirus program on all the devices you use including your phone and tablet and make sure to keep it up to date because you can all uh, see that nowadays uh, updates are uh, coming up every now and then every updates are coming up so it is advisable to uh, update your device whichever device you are using be it your phone be it your laptop or computer you update it from time to time then use a firewall to control which programs have access to the internet because firewall can prevent an infected program from broadcasting your sensitive data. Yes, it is always uh, advisable to use a firewall to uh, search a program. Then avoid malicious web pages and links by installing a browser extension that scans the pages you visit. Uh, it is very important because uh, uh, in most of the times when you are visiting a web page you might be uh, encountering with some of the pop-up messages that uh, this website uses cookies and to further proceed to the website the content of the website you have to or you are asked to accept the cookies and if you ask uh, accept the cookies you generally tend to give uh, consent to all your data or information that is available in your system to that particular website. So knowingly or unknowingly that website is uh, having access to all your information uh, that is available in that particular device. So it is advisable uh, that you do not click on any malicious web pages and links. Then avoid using public Wi-Fi networks. Uh, don't use public networks for shop online or log in to your online banking account. So it is a general tendency to look for Wi-Fi because you can see that most of the uh, public transport uh, uh, systems, be it an airport or railway station, uh, they provide uh, Wi-Fi or even if you go uh, for a restaurant or a hotel they also provide a Wi-Fi but it is advisable not to use such kind of public Wi-Fi system to uh, get access to your banking details or uh, to any social uh, media sites uh, because uh, they may have access if you log into that uh, public Wi-Fi address uh, the hackers or the cyber criminals may have access to your information through that public Wi-Fi system. Then be aware, uh, aware of emails with atta attached files and links and don't open files or click on links from unknown senders. The same rule applies to uh, links which are available in social media. So um, it is happening nowadays that we get a link from an unknown number even in our uh, social media account we get some links that um, uh, saying some of the uh, 
uh, or informing about some of the events which you might be interested in it uh, interested in it so you uh, might tend to click on the link given but uh, we have to be very cautious uh, before clicking on such links because those may uh, because those links may uh, tend to be dangerous for us. And online downloads are common sources of malware. So once somebody said that no, nothing in this entire world is free. So if you are having anything, if you are uh, having any app or um, suppose uh, you are uh, wishing to watch a movie online, uh, through a pirated site and you get to download it or anything any information any data any entertainment source if you are getting online and you are getting free then from now onwards do keep it a second thought because nothing in this world is free if they are giving you the link for free they might be asking you for something uh, uh, without letting you know and uh, by agreeing to their uh, terms and condition you might be giving them the consent to uh, have access to your personal information in your own system so uh, we should be always aware of all these things and if maximum people get aware of such kind of things that we should not do uh, these kind of activities then uh, the extent of cybercrime or the internet threats can be minimized to a large extent so that is it uh, for today uh, in the later part we will be sharing some of the clips uh, images and video which are relevant for this particular video so stay tuned for our next video session till then thank you for being with us namaskar